Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to our next session of the APDR National Virtual Noon Conference. My name is Dr. Harp Beatty. Uh, I'm the chair of the Education Committee for the APDR and the Neuroradiology Fellowship Director at Boston Medical Center. Uh, welcome to our session. Just a few housekeeping items as we go through every week. Um, uh, as you know, the webinar is being recorded and it'll be hosted on the APDR YouTube channel uh, within about a week's time to turn over. Um, the webinar, again, is being recorded, as are all the questions and comments. Um, your uh, microphones are muted as attendees to ensure optimal quality for the participants. If you do have questions for the uh, presenters, we ask that you use the question and answer tool through the Zoom platform. and. Uh, we can try to answer them after their lectures or certainly um, uh, email you responses uh, at a later time. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, two speakers for today. We are so grateful to have Dr. Maitre Patel and Dr. John Pellerito join us today under their very busy schedules. Um, Dr. Patel will be speaking on patterns, pearls, and pitfalls in adnexal ultrasound, and Dr. Pellerito on complications of first trimester pregnancy. So without further ado, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us, guys. And I will hand over the screen share to Dr. Patel to start his talk. All right. Well, thanks for joining uh, today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about um, some patterns, pearls, and pitfalls in uh, evaluating the adnexa. I have nothing to disclose other than the fact that I'm going to go really fast. Because this is recorded, you can go back and watch it again if you need to. Uh, but there's a lot of material here to cover. Uh, so the fundamental objective for today's talk is for you to be able to understand why I'm asking you these two questions and then to answer these two questions. When you see an indexal mass, first, should the mass go to a surgeon? And secondly, should the mass go to my surgeon? And so at the end of the talk, hopefully you understand the rationale behind those two questions. Now, here's 14 diagnoses that you can have for any adnexal mass. This should cover every adnexal mass uh, that's out there. And so obviously it would be really ridiculous for you to put all 14 things in your differential. Um, moreover, some of these things are actually the same thing stated twice, but more specifically. So a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst is really a type of non-neoplastic cyst. Similarly, an ovarian fibroma is a type of solid mass. But there's a purpose as to why you might want to dump these uh, findings that you see in the adnexa into one of these 14 buckets. Uh, and the way we do that uh, is to ask ourselves first, am I reasonably confident that I know what this is? When I see a mass on ultrasound, does it have an ant mini appearance? I love ant minis because they make it easy to get through the day. Uh, but secondly, if it isn't clear to me exactly what this is or most likely to be, is there another test, which might even include waiting a little bit and getting a follow-up ultrasound that won't harm this patient or unreasonably delay their care that has a chance to be useful? So the bottom line is that pattern recognition really does work. Many scoring systems have been developed. Uh, the most extensive one has been the one that was developed by the IOTA group in Europe. And a lot of studies have shown that these models work pretty good and almost as well as expert pattern recognition. So really the choice is yours. Uh, we're giving you an option. You can either learn to use pattern recognition, which I think is the way to go, or you can get out your calculators, and uh, this is the formula. This will be on the boards. You will need to know all of these numbers. Obviously, I'm joking, uh, but it's an important formula uh, only in the sense that it actually only answers one question. Is the mass a benign, neoplas a benign mass or is it a malignancy? That's the only purpose of this particular formula, but you can see from the inputs at the bottom, everything in white is the clinical stuff, everything in orange is the stuff that you get from the ultrasound. And quite clearly, you can see that the clinical stuff is really simple. You don't even need to have an expert sending you these things. I mean, all you need to know is whether the patient's had a personal history of ovarian cancer, what her hormonal status is, how old she is, and whether she has pain during the exam, that's it. And you can get these things easily during your exam or your sonographer's exam. The rest of the stuff uh, is, uh, looks pretty straightforward, but uh, can be a little challenging. So there are three important facts that uh, you need to remember when you're looking at an exome mass. Number one, this management of this mass is almost entirely up to what you say in your report. Uh, 
Uh, we all have done internships, some of us have done residencies, and I can tell you that I never encountered a physical examination on a woman where I said, oh yeah, that adnexal mass is a cancer. Oh no, on physical exam, that one is an endometrioma. It's just not possible. It's all about what you say in your report. At the same time, what you say, you want to avoid uh, pushing people into unnecessary intervention because the vast majority of these masses are going to be non-neoplastic ovarian cysts that'll go away by themselves. Uh, at the same time, six to eight week follow-up is not always the answer. And sometimes I, I get a little irritated when all people wanna do is always get six to eight week follow-up ultrasounds for findings that actually have a conclusion that you can make. So this is a complicated sort of uh, algorithm uh, that I wrote uh, many years ago, 15 years ago now. Uh, and it's not something I came up with. Literally, I, I, I basically plagiarized this off of what I had been taught uh, 15 years earlier. Uh, so this has been around for a while, but this is sort of what we're gonna go through in terms of the thought process for what we do when we identify an indexal mass, what patterns we're looking for. And the first pattern is to understand whether the mass is a simple cyst. Because if the mass is a simple cyst, then our next question is, uh, is this a non-neoplastic cyst or a benign neoplasm? That's the only two things on the differential. And if it's very likely to be a non-neoplastic cyst, we're gonna ignore it. And if it's reasonable that it might be a, a benign neoplasm versus a non-neoplastic cyst, we're gonna follow it. So uh, the first thing to understand is um, this question, when do you assume that an ovarian simple cyst is likely to be non-neoplastic and basically you ignore it? So a few pitfalls to keep in mind. Number one, um, not every cyst should be called a cyst. Uh, and the SRU, which is a great organization and I encourage everyone to join, uh, is um, at, at the Society of Radiologists and Ultrasound. Uh, and they came out with um, a consensus statement that said, look, if you have a follicle that's up to three centimeters in size, and especially if it's in a premenopausal, or obviously it's in a premenopausal patient, that's just a normal finding and you don't need to call it a cyst. You can certainly say that there's a dominant follicle in the left ovary, uh, but sometimes calling it a cyst just implies that there's pathology when in fact this is just a normal finding. The other pitfall then is to not try to know whether the patient is pre or postmenopausal. So in our practice, uh, no longer on the first images as we show in this case, but we always know uh, we always ask when the patient's LMP is, uh, we always know when we're doing the study and we can compare the two and understand what phase of the menstrual cycle the patient's in. And that's really important. Okay, non-neoplastic cysts are very common in premenopausal patients. Uh, they happen every month, but uh, they also occur in postmenopausal patients. Uh, and what you need to know here is that about half of them will resolve on their own over time, but they don't resolve in six to eight weeks. These things aren't that dynamic as they are in premenopausal patients, and they can take a year to two to resolve. And some of them don't resolve at all, but they just stay the same size. So resolution is more common if they're, uh, the patient's less than 10 years into her uh, postmenopausal period. So the principle is that a simple cyst has no malignant risk. If, you're, uh, if you've imaged it well, and it's absolutely a simple cyst, the mass is either a non-neoplastic cyst or it's a benign neoplasm, you're done. So what do we mean by a simple cyst? I've talked about this and I haven't really defined it yet, so let's define it. A simple cyst is a cyst that lacks internal septations or nodularity, the wall is smooth, it has no internal echoes, it's anechoic, and it's oval or round in shape. If the mass that you're looking at in the adnexa meets these criteria, then it's either a non-neoplastic cyst or a benign neoplasm, and malignancy is practically excluded. So when do we decide to follow these? That's a good question, and it's all really a probability function, um, and it's helpful to have some guidelines. And so the uh, SRU uh, has revised their guidelines for managing asymptomatic patients with simple cysts, or patients who have symptoms that aren't clinically actionable who have simple cysts. And the standard uh, that they propose is that if the cyst is less than or equal to five centimeters in size in the patient's premenopausal, then uh, you can conclude that it's most likely to be non-neoplastic and no follow-up is really necessary. And if it's less than or equal to three centimeters and she's postmenopausal, you can make the same conclusions. Now, there is a caveat that if you have a superior ultrasound, 
which means you have pristine images. You're an experienced reader. And the patient has, most importantly, cine clips on your set of images in two planes. And you can be confident that your sonographer didn't sandbag you and not show you this little nodule in the corner. Then you can actually raise those size limits up to seven centimeters for premenopausal patients and five centimeters to postmenopausal patients. And that's a safe practice to do. So then obviously we would follow the ones that are not meeting those criteria. But the pitfall to remember is uh, the not understanding why you're following the cyst. You're not following the cyst because you have a reasonable expectation that this might be a malignancy. You're following it for two reasons. Number one, did we make a mistake in characterizing the cyst? And this is why we get to raise the size threshold when we have beautiful images and cine clips because the chance that we made a mistake is even lower. But secondly, we want to understand how fast it's growing. So, in the past, there may have been a thought that some of these simple cysts might actually develop into malignancies, but that really isn't true. It turns out that um, that isn't the way that uh, invasive uh, cyst adenocarcinomas develop in the ovary. They actually develop from the, um, the cells along the, the tube, which is different uh, than uh, the uh, patients who have uh, uh, benign cysts that come from the ovary itself, these epithelial tumors. So you have a 55-year-old, she's asymptomatic, she's postmenopausal. It's a pretty good looking look, uh, cyst. It's over four centimeters in average size. When do you get the follow-up study? And if you have a number of choices here, and life is in a series of multiple choice questions, uh, but you might in your mind have a series of answers that you might consider. Two weeks, I'm gonna get a six week follow-up, I'm gonna get a three month follow-up, six to 12 months. What's the right answer here for when you'd get the follow-up? And um, I would articulate that the best answer uh, is a six to 12 month follow-up, depending on you know, if you were, how confident you are. So, uh, and also um, how fast this thing might be growing. Uh, why is that? Well, here's uh, some unpublished research that I'm doing with uh, one of my residents uh, that shows you on a hundred cystadenomas and cystadenofibromas that we looked at that actually had two imaging studies, how fast do they grow? Uh, and it turns out that only a third of them grow with a doubling time in terms of volume of less than a year. Now remember, a doubling time in terms of volume is really a 25% increase in the linear dimension of a mass. So if a mass goes from four to five centimeters, it has gone up by 25% in linear dimension, it's actually doubled in volume. And so it turns out these benign cyst adenomas and benign cyst adenofibromas, about a third of them will double uh, such that their volume of doubling is within a year. And that's going to be readily demonstrated on a followed sonogram in uh, a number of different uh, time intervals. But about a third of them actually double within one to five years. So they're relatively slow growing. And about a third of them don't seem to grow at all. They're either doubling so slowly that it's hard to measure, or uh, in fact, there's no growth whatsoever. That's important information to keep in mind because uh, if you have a cyst that's four centimeters and it's doubling, let's say in one of the faster categories, it's doubling at half a year, let's say. In six weeks, if you measure that cyst that's growing, it's gonna be 4.2 centimeters. And I can guarantee you, you will not know that it's growing uh, because it's hard to measure these things exactly the same way each time. Whereas if you measure it again in six months, this is for the fast growing ones, it'll be five centimeters and that's a pretty obvious change. And obviously at two years, it'll be even much bigger at seven and a half centimeters. But let's say it's not one of those. Let's say it's one of the ones that's growing in the one to five year uh, time frame. Well, then at six weeks, you've got no chance of knowing whether this is growing or not. At six months, if you look, it still won't be much of a difference. And you might erroneously conclude that this thing's not growing at all, when in fact it is slowly growing. So you need a couple of years here to tell uh, that this thing is growing um, if it's in one of those slower growing categories. And this is the problem. I mean, this turns out to be on path, a cyst adenoma. Uh, and these are six months apart. Uh, and so the first study at six centimeters, the second study at 6.6 .6 centimeters. So it's grown by 10% uh, in terms of a linear volume, but has it actually changed in size, it's very hard to tell, right? I mean, you've got two measurements, but you know, we're pressing a little harder on one versus the other. Uh, maybe the sonographer has a slightly different obliquity. Very difficult to tell these measurement variabilities on ultrasound. 
So the bottom line is that if you're going to follow a cyst because it's reasonable to do so, because you're trying to distinguish whether it's growing or not, pick an appropriate time interval and don't pick one that's too fast. Uh, certainly don't get one in six to 12 weeks. Your first follow-up shouldn't be at least until six months if it's a simple cyst. And I would prefer that you actually wait for 12 months. Uh, the reason being that if she's asymptomatic or has symptoms that aren't really clinically actionable, um, nobody's gonna make her better, feel better uh, by predicting that it's actually growing in six months. And even if it is growing, it's only gonna be a little bit bigger. Uh, what the SRU says is, is get your first one in six to 12 months, and then if it hasn't changed a lot, get your last one and your second one at 24 months. So this is the new algorithm uh, that was published recently in radiology in 2019. And I certainly encourage you to go look at that. But the bottom line is if you look down here, if a mass has steadily increased in size over those two time points that we recommend, uh, then you're actually done imaging the mass. You can make a diagnosis. And the pattern that you recognize here is that the simple cyst that's growing is most likely an enlarging benign neoplasm. Now, does she need to have that taken out? Maybe not. Uh, in fact, there's good evidence to suggest that if she's got not clinically actionable symptoms, that it's reasonable to not take that out because there's some harm to surgery. Bottom line is that you push them back and say, this is now clinically managed. You tell us when you want to get the follow-up based on uh, you know, whether the patient has symptoms or not, knowing that she has a benign neoplasm. If it hasn't changed in size, it is probably non-neoplastic, but it still could be one of these indolent benign neoplasms. So it could still grow very slowly over time. We're not going to ask for further follow-up. She may not even need to have further clinical follow-up until she has clinically actionable symptoms. So if we go back to our algorithm and we say, well, you know what, the mass I'm looking at is not a simple cyst. Well, the second question, and this is an important one, is to ask yourself what pattern you're looking for is, could this be a physiologic pattern? Could actually the things that I'm looking at that make it not look like a simple cyst be to do to normal physiology? And so there are a number of things that can do that. First, a joining cyst. Obviously, if you have two cysts together next to each other, the ovarian parenchyma can look like a septation. So one of the pitfalls is concluding that just because you see what looks like a septation is that that's actually a neoplasm. In fact, ovarian tissue trapped between two cysts will have blood flow, and you can't conclude that just because it has blood flow that this is a neoplasm. Involution is really common for uh, benign non-neoplastic cysts. Uh, these are both patients who had non-neoplastic cysts that went away, but you can see that there's a little bit of wall irregularity in this smaller cyst and this bigger cyst. And this looks like a cyst adenofibroma to me if you were to ask me that, and said that this thing was stable. Uh, so the conclu conclusion that uh, because it has a slight bit of nodularity that it is a neoplasm is not necessarily correct. And obviously a corpus luteum has a recognizable look that you need to be familiar with. It almost looks solid in many patients uh, here without fluid within it, uh, but you can recognize it by seeing the circle of flow, which uh, Dr. Pellerito, I think, uh, actually uh, defined as this uh, ring of fire. Uh, and uh, that is a characteristic look for a corpus luteum. And finally, hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is a physiologic process in simple cysts uh, and uh, hemorrhagic cysts, not simple, they be, become not simple after they bleed, uh, that can be very confusing. So you need to be familiar with the appearance of hemorrhage. Hemorrhage uh, can look very ugly, but it has these fibrin strands, we'll look at that in a second, have these pseudo septations, which is really due to retracting clot. This is clot, not wall nodules, and there's some ways to tell that that's clot. One of the key features, obviously, of hemorrhagic ovarian cysts is that they have echoes in them. And so internal echoes is the key feature, and oftentimes they're clumped. This lace-like uh, appearance where we have these little lines that run through the echoes is very characteristic of a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst with fibrin strands. And retracting clot is something that you really want to become uh, good at looking at because it'll be your friend in lots of cases. Retracting clot is this clumped echoes that are on the wall of a hemorrhagic cyst. They actually have a different echogenicity than the wall, as we well demonstrate in this case, and uh, to some extent in this case as well. But these retracting clots have scalloped margins or straight margins. Uh, no self-respecting neoplasm or malignancy is going to have a wall-based mural nodule that grows with flat or concave margins. 
The other thing, uh, so, uh, you know, this is one of those, one of these is not like the other. You can tell the difference just by the morphology that this is vegetative in appearance. This is more retracting in appearance. But the key is obviously looking for flow and you don't want to see flow in something that you think is clot. So it's important that you always look for blood flow in these things. Another useful feature is actually look for that ring of fire. It may not be demonstrated throughout the whole um, cyst or, or mass, uh, but uh, all of these hemorrhagic ovarian cysts tend to be arising from the corpus luteum. So they have a lot of flow around their margins. So if you can see that, you can be even more confident that you're dealing with a corpus luteum. So this mass, which you know, I guess could be a benign neoplasm, as we said, or a non-neoplastic cyst, it's a simple cyst, but the fact that it has this rim of flow around it makes it much more likely to be a corpus luteum and a simple cyst as a result of that. Okay, well, uh, if the mass is uh, a simple, not a simple cyst, but the findings could be due to a physiologic pattern, then we're back to this side of the equation and we're going to ask ourselves, well, how likely is this thing going to be non-neoplastic? And there's some guidelines. Uh, the SRU says essentially it's the same thing. If it's a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst and you're very confident of that, you don't need to follow it if it's less than five centimeters in size. If you're not so confident uh, or if it's bigger than that, then certainly get a follow-up. In that case, it's reasonable to get the follow-up in six to eight weeks. Well, I usually do uh, eight to 12 weeks personally because there's really no rush to get it in six weeks unless you're really kind of worried. So then the rest of the talk, and we only have like eight minutes left, is to just go through some patterns of other types of masses. So endometriomas have a characteristic look. They have low level internal echoes, as you see here. Now I just told you that low level echoes is a feature of hemorrhage. And so there's no real way looking at these two endometriomas uh, to say that they're endometriomas and not hemorrhagic ovarian cysts that are acute. Uh, but there are some other features. Like, so in this example, this uh, image on this side of the screen uh, is a patient who had uh, acute hemorrhagic cysts. These went away. This patient had an endometrioma that didn't go away. And so uh, you need to recognize that some hemorrhagic ovarian cysts will look like endometriomas and they will resolve on their own. So what can we look for to try to distinguish the two? Well, number one, these little echogenic foci on the wall. So if you see these echogenic foci on the wall of a mass that has low level echoes and no internal flow, so you're thinking it's either an endometrioma or a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst, these things are thought to be due to cholesterol deposits. And they look very much like adenomyomatosis of the gallbladder, right? But the bottom line is that what happens is that the cell membranes of the red blood cells that have been floating around an endometrioma for a while, they kind of migrate off to the edge and these phagocytes in the ovary will then chop them up and become non-digestible uh, cellular material. And our theory is that that accounts for some of these cholesterol deposits. And that's why you wouldn't see them in acute hemorrhagic ovarian cysts because they haven't been around long enough for the cell membranes to kind of uh, be a problem. So again, look carefully for these things. These are bright, uh, they're scattered, uh, and they're punctate. The other thing, obviously, for endometriomas is that they change over, they don't change as much over time as hemorrhagic ovarian cysts. So the thing on the top is an acute hemorrhagic ovarian cyst, looks like an endometrioma, but on follow-up it went away. Whereas the thing on the bottom is an endometrioma that actually got slightly smaller, which is okay. They can inspissate a little bit, but they tend not to go away um, mostly. Now, uh, having said that, I have seen some endometriomas that after two or three years, believe it or not, have gone away over that period of time. Now, I want to be clear, those little punctate echogenic foci aren't clumped. Uh, they're solitary, they're, they can be scattered, uh, but this is a completely different animal, this uh, image on this side of the screen. These things are clumped, uh, they're sort of more papillary in appearance perhaps. Uh, this was a uh, mucinous uh, borderline cystadenocarcinoma. Here's an endometrioma and it has a, a wall nodule. And so now you're looking at the wall nodule and go, well, can Doppler help me exclude that this is a, not potentially a, a malignancy? And the answer unfortunately is no, not enough. You have to respect the morphology. So this is, turns out to be an endometrioma, but looking at this image, you cannot say that this is definitely an endometrioma. You have to keep uh, a, a neoplasm on the differential, and this needs to get follow-up or uh, evaluated with some other mechanism. 
Let's turn our attention really quickly to cystic teratomas, dermoids. These have a uh, characteristic appearance, a pattern, if you will. Uh, this is one that has all four of those patterns. They have acoustic impedance, so a shadowing area. They have areas that are bright, regional bright echoes. They have these dot dash appearance of the hair. And they can, in fact, have this fluid fluid level or hair fluid level. Uh, this is a sagittal image on endovag, which is why it's going in this direction. Now, none of these things in individual are foolproof, uh, but it turns out that three-fourths of dermoids will have more than one feature. And in the uh, paper that we wrote many years ago, we did not find any false positives out of 224 uh, cases. Uh, now, having said that, I'm sure there is going to be a false positive, but just keep in mind that if you have two or more features of a dermoid, it's almost certainly going to be a dermoid. The one thing you want to do though is make sure it doesn't have internal blood flow because dermoids are cysts. They do not have internal blood flow. So the pitfall is to think that a, a, a thing that looks like a dermoid, such as this mass that has shadowing, it has regional bright echoes, but you put color on and it's got flow in it. This turns out to be an exophytic lipolyomyoma, not a dermoid. Can't be a dermoid uh, because it has flow in it. These things can sometimes be unrecognized. So the sonographer goes through her uh, his or her uh, images and you know measures the uterus here and there's a huge dermoid here so you need to be on the lookout for this pattern of this dot dash with shadowing and then once you recognize it uh, you can take directed images and see many more of the features of a dermoid in this nine centimeter dermoid that essentially the sonographer missed. Here's another dermoid with shadowing uh, it's got the dot dash appearance. It looks really ugly if you weren't able to recognize these sorts of characteristic features. Dermoid, dermoid here, dermoid here, not a dermoid. And so not everything that kind of looks like a dermoid is a dermoid. If we really analyze this carefully, there's not that many dots or dashes. There's really not any bright echoes in part of the mass other than this shadowing. This shadowing is actually coming from outside this mass. This turns out to be a mucinous cystadenoma. Um, so yeah, you can make mistakes. So that was a mucinous cystadenoma. Okay, turning our attention then, we've got a couple minutes left, hydrosalpinx and peritoneal inclusion cyst. Uh, hydrosalpinx has, uh, it's like a slam dunk no-brainer when you see a separate ovary, but there are some other features even if you don't see a separate ovary that are helpful such as a tubular fluid collection uh, with either incomplete septations or these what we call beads on a string, these little dots on the wall. But more helpful, I think, is this waist sign, which is sort of this uh, indentation that you'll see. So here's a tubular mass that has an incomplete septation uh, on this second image, but I put uh, asterisks on the waist sign. So this thing kind of pinches in at both sides. So if you see an area that kind of pinches in, look diametrically opposite, if you see another pinch in, that's the waist sign in a tubular mass, that's almost always a hydrosalpinx. And here are the likelihood ratios for that. Come back to the slide if you want to, but eventually the bottom line is that these incomplete septations and short linear projections by themselves are, are reasonable features of hydrosalpinx, but can be seen in cystadenomas and cystadenofibromas. So you really wanna see that tubular shape and that waist sign. And it really helps to scan or to watch the sonographer scan or to, to watch the cine clip on some of these. These are both, uh, I mean, this is one's hydrosalpinx. Apparently inclusion cyst is a, a little harder diagnosis to make, quite frankly. Uh, it is a mass that essentially is, uh, deforms, uh, it actually aligns with a deformed ovary. So essentially it grows on the surface of an ovary and the ovary is deformed. So this mass is really hard to recognize as anything. But if you look for this pattern of a sharp angle, so any cyst that has a really sharp angle at an interface with a, what might be ovarian tissue, you should be thinking about a peritoneal inclusion cyst. Here's a couple of follicles. Here's a couple of strands that comes off the surface of this ovary. Here's a sharp angle. I'll show you that again. So this cyst, yeah, you're gonna say, well, it looks like a simple cyst, but Dr. Patel, it has a sharp angle. That is my clue that this is a peritoneal inclusion cyst. Then I look to see, hey, is the rest of the ovary deformed? Yeah, sure it is, it's deformed. It's kind of boomerang shaped. Here's a follicle, here's a follicle, here's a follicle. This is a deformed ovary in a peritoneal inclusion cyst. Another case of a sharp angled cyst adjacent to what looks like ovarian tissue with follicles, this is a peritoneal inclusion cyst. All right, 
uh, last minute, uh, because we're at the end of our time, uh, talking about benign cystic neoplasms and cystic malignancies. Uh, cyst adenomas and cyst adenofibromas, they can be simple in appearance as we've seen, uh, but they tend to have some septations, uh, even some wall irregularity, that's fairly common. Um, the difference between malignancies and benign neoplasms is not only related to the patient's age and if you see ascites, but the a quantity and the vascularity of the solid parts. So here are two malignancies and they don't look benign at all. These, this is a solid part of the mass. This is a large solid part of the mass. It has a lot of blood flow in it. Uh, these are malignancies. And it's important uh, that you identify malignancies prior to them going to surgery because the most important factor for survival for these patients is whether they get treated by the right person to begin with. Uh, and so um, I think that ORADS does a nice job of kind of walking you through this. So I definitely would encourage you to look at the ORADS paper. There's a lot of diagrams on there and a lot of management recommendations. This is kind of hard for you to see. Um, and this isn't the most important one. If there's one image from ORADS that I want to take you away with, it's this one. This I think is the most important image uh, from that paper. They've got some really nice pictures and shout out to Lori Strakowski who I think was involved in making these pictures. But this is good because it's the image of what you shouldn't be so worried about malignancy on even though you know it's not going to be a simple cyst. So these things that are have slight wall irregularity without much color flow or septations that are thin or even solid that has no uh, demonstrable flow. These are more likely to be benign neoplasms. And the reason it's important for you to know that is because those can be taken out by your surgeon. If you're at a regional center or a, uh, a community hospital, all of you right now are, are at academic centers for the most part, and all of you are uh, probably have access to GYN oncologists in your practice. But that's not the case when you go out into practice uh, it, you know, in other locations. And so it's going to be important for you as the imager to say, hey, this is a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst with retracting clot that's different from the wall. This patient, if she needs follow-up, will get follow-up with me and not go see any surgeon. This is not a simple cyst. This looks like a neoplasm, but it doesn't have a lot of malignant features. It's relatively small, the patient's not that old. It looks like it might be a cystadenofibroma or cystadenoma. It needs to probably come out, but my surgeon can take care of this. And this is a malignancy. It's got solid areas. It's got septal nodules. This patient needs to be seen by a GYN oncologist. So in conclusion, uh, I hope I've been able to show you the patterns, the pitfalls, uh, and uh, the process by which you can make a diagnosis uh, and not have everything, not have all 14 things in your differential, understanding these uh, patterns will help you manage your patients uh, in an appropriate manner. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. We really appreciate that talk. Um, I would like to invite Dr. Pellerito to uh, share his screen now and uh, begin his session. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with all of you. and. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Beatty for setting up these lectures. They are an oasis for resident education at this time. I also want to thank my residents at Northwell for their dedication and selfless participation on the medical floors during their redeployment uh, during this crisis. Okay, so let's get started. So the objectives for the next few minutes is we're going to review the normal sonographic landmarks in the first trimester. We're going to recognize findings associated with the non-viable pregnancy. We'll discuss the role of color impulse Doppler in complicated first trimester pregnancy. And I hope to make you smile with some baby memes. I'm gonna keep it simple and give you some facts to remember to help your patients as well as do well on your boards. So obviously the tools that we use for first trimester evaluation include both the transabdominal and transvaginal sonogram, right? Those are, those are our key components. We'll also include cine loop or video clips when they're helpful. We can use M-mode ultrasound to help us diagnose the cardiac activity. And when applicable, we can also include color pulsed and powered up. Now, when we do our studies, we typically will start out with a limited transabdominal scan, which would then be followed by a transvaginal ultrasound. 
you can see from this example here that you know, we're doing a transabdominal scan. The bladder is not very distended. And we see the uterus, a little bit of fluid in the cul-de-sac. What was interesting about this case, this is a patient who presented with a positive pregnancy test and the vaginal scan doesn't really show an intrauterine pregnancy. But the transabdominal scan does show what looks like a gestational sac. And this was an ectopic pregnancy sitting on the fundus of the uterus, something we wouldn't, might not have necessarily picked up on the endovaginal scan alone. So the transabdominal scan can be pretty helpful for finding things you might not see on that limited transvaginal scan. So obviously important when we're doing these study to talk to the patient, either yourself or have the sonographer get some really key clinical information. In fact, we use the first box of every scan to include what I think is pertinent clinical information that, that is either obtained by the sonographer or by myself. I wanna know about the last menstrual period, history of pain, bleeding or fever, try to get a quick medical and obstetric history, I uh, want to know about any assisted reproductive techniques, IUI, IVF, any history of prior surgery or ectopic pregnancy, and obviously if they've joined an HCG, what that would be. Uh, we'd like to get as much clinical history as possible um, because it's helpful to you in making your diagnosis, and lawyers expect that. You know, if a case does go on to become a, a a legal case, they're going to want to know if you had this information when you were in interpreting the study. So these are the major sonographic landmarks that we see in our evaluation in order of appearance. We first see a gestational sac, we then may see a double decidual sac sign, and then the yolk sac, embryo with cardiac activity. Here's a chart that shows you how quickly these findings will, will show up on our scan. Starting at about five weeks, we'll see a gestational sac. And then about five and a half weeks, the yolk sac will appear. And by about six weeks, we'll see the embryo with a heartbeat. So you can see very quickly, we will be able to see these findings between five and six weeks. And they occur about one week later with transabdominal sonography. So here was a 32-year-old. She presented with right low quadrant pain. Her last menstrual period was about five weeks ago. Her HCG was 2100. So you can see they're right at the threshold, just about five weeks with a quant around 2000. We would start and hope to see something in the uterus. On the transabdominal scan, we see what looks like a normal endometrial lining, no sac. We look at the right and next, it looks a little busy like there's some fullness of some soft tissue there. On the endovaginal or the transvaginal scan, we can see that there is a well-defined sac-like structure within the uterus, in the endometrium. And in addition, we could see with the, with the help of color Doppler that there is a hemorrhagic corpus luteum. So the vaginal scan helps us out here because we can see that there's an early IUP and a right corpus luteum that probably explains the pain that the patient was having in the right lower quadrant. So we look for gestational sac and we can identify it as a small rounded cystic fluid collection that will be within the decidual lining of the uterus. When we see this sac-like structure, little fluid collection with well-defined borders, it likely represents an intrauterine pregnancy. And here you could see this inner ring and then we could see the deciduous surrounding it very likely to be an IUP. And as I mentioned, we see this at approximately five weeks gestational age. We expect the normal gestational sac to increase in size about one millimeter per day. It first implants within the endometrium, and we call that the intradecidual sign. And then as it grows, we'll see this, this lining, this echogenic area expanding around the sac, which we call the double decidual sac sign. So here's an example of the intradecidual sign. We see a very tiny sac, tiny fluid collection in the endometrium. It's the earliest sign of an IUP. This is where the fertilized egg implants into the decidualized endometrium. Notice it's in the wall. It's not in the canal. If it were in the canal, it would, it would not be able to implant. So we expect to see this 
early sign in the endometrial wall. The double deciduous sac sign refers to these two echogenic rings. The outer ring is the maternal layer or decidual layer. The inner ring is the gestational sac or the chorionic layer. And here we see them very well. But in actual practice, we see them about 50% of the time to see them as clearly as we do here. Now, there is a differential diagnosis for a cystic fluid collection in the uterus. If it's not a gestational sac, it could represent blood in the endometrial canal, or it could be a pseudogestational sac or a decidual cyst from an ectopic pregnancy. Here we see what looks like a fluid fluid level within the endometrial canal, and this is blood within the canal. Uh, this is pretty, fairly easy to recognize because we don't really see a sac-like structure. This one's a little bit tougher. This is a pseudogestational sac, and you can see there's thickening of the lining and fluid in between. So on this view, it could potentially represent an intrauterine gestational sac. Now, there are ways to distinguish a pseudogestational sac from a gestational sac um, when, you, when you're not sure. Uh, with the pseudogestational sac, you can see thickening of the deciduous surrounding an intrauterine fluid collection. But important distinctions is that you will not see a double deciduous sac sign. Obviously, there'll be no yolk sac, embryo, or heartbeat. And which I find very helpful, there is no placental flow on Doppler imaging. And we'll explore that in just a couple of minutes, how valuable color and pulse Doppler can be in distinguishing between an intrauterine pregnancy and a pseudogestational sac. We estimate gestational age by measuring the mean sac diameter. And by doing so, we're measuring all three planes and we take the average. That average is then used to calculate the estimated gestational age. You can see in this case here, this sac measures about seven weeks, two days gestational age. And we only measure the sonolucent area. Here's an example of the yolk sac, the next, the next finding that we will have in a normal intrauterine pregnancy. It's a rounded structure up to about five millimeters in size. It's the first structure we see within the intrauterine gestational sac. We see it by about five and a half weeks and is the first real proof that we have an intrauterine pregnancy. It's important to recognize that the upper limit of normal in size for yolk sac is 5.6 millimeters. When it's greater than that, that's a poor prognostic sign. Next, we'll see the embryo. And it starts out as an embryonic disc adjacent to the yolk sac. And here's the yolk sac, there's the disc. It's been called the diamond ring sign. Radiologists love cute signs. And here you can see why it's, it's described that way because it has the ring and then the diamond next to it. Um, we see it at about six weeks gestational age. And then of course, once we identify the embryo, we will measure it to determine the crown rump length to determine gestational age. And we do so by measuring the longest axis of the embryo. And this turns out to be the most accurate for dating the pregnancy in the first trimester. So everything that, all measurements that are taken are really based around this crown lump, rump measurement to make sure that the pregnancy is proceeding and growing normally. The amnion is this thin membrane that is initially attached to the embryo, but then fills with fluid during the fourth to fifth week. The embryo will then form within the amnion and as it fills with fluid, the amnion will eventually adhere to the surface of the chorion. Cardiac activity, as I said, occurs at about six weeks. The mean sac diameter, right, the crown rump length, and it should all be in a, a certain size. The mean sac diameter should be at least 2.5 centimeters, and the crown rump length is usually around seven millimeters, and you should see a heartbeat within the embryo. If you see an embryo that's less than seven millimeters without a heartbeat, that to me is very suspicious for a failed pregnancy. But we typically will wait till it's at least seven millimeters before we call it a failed pregnancy. 
Now, here's the chart of, of typical HCG levels. These are threshold levels for seeing uh, an intrauterine pregnancy. 2,000 is really the threshold. Uh, below 2,000, you may not see any fluid with, or sac within the endometrial canal. By 3,000, you should see a sac within the uterus. Now, if the HCG is low for dates, the patient's dates are six to seven weeks, and we have a very low quant, that's, that's abnormal, and suggests that it's gonna be uh, a failed pregnancy. But keep in mind that with ectopic pregnancy, the levels can be very variable. They can be high or they can be low. And I think it's a misconception that patients who present with low HCG levels of 1,000 or less of not being able to have an ectopic pregnancy. They can have an ectopic pregnancy as the levels can be low and will continue to drop even with an ectopic. Now let's talk about some poor prognostic signs. Um, an empty or abnormal gestational sac, an, uh, bradycardia or, or slow heartbeat, abnormal yolk sac, or a large subchorionic hematoma. So here's some quick examples. Here's a very large abnormal gestational sac. Again, if it's greater than 25 millimeters without an embryo, it's an abnormal pregnancy. Uh, it should grow about a millimeter per day. And then there's some other findings that we will see. Here's an example of a large empty sac, but it's an abnormal shape. It's flattened, it's elongated. This is a failed pregnancy. Here's an example of an abnormal yolk sac. It's too large. Anything greater than seven millimeters is, is abnormal and it's a poor prognostic sign. Other things that would show uh, be abnormal for a yolk sac would be a calcified yolk sac or multiple yolk sacs with a single embryo. For example, here's a patient that has three yolk sac, but there was a single embryo. It's a poor prognostic sign and it was a failed pregnancy. Here's an example of a perigestational or subchorionic hematoma. This is typically associated with vaginal bleeding, what we call a threatened abortion. And this is the most common abnormality in the first trimester. We see it about 25% of the time. More examples of subchorionic hematomas. The prognosis depends on the size of the hematoma. Most are gonna be small and associated with a good outcome, but the larger the hematoma, obviously, the worst of prognosis. Here's a small one. His patient presented with bleeding at seven weeks. We see a sliver of hemorrhage adjacent to the gestational sac. We check the heartbeat with M mode. And here you could see the activity here. And we can see that there is a heartbeat. And so this patient did well. The hematoma resolved and the patient went on to full term delivery. But some cases where the hematomas are large, it's, it's a very poor prognostic sign. And as I mentioned, the larger the hematoma, the less likely the pregnancy will go to term. Here's something you'll see on occasion. Here's a patient that presented six weeks after the last menstrual period with this mass in the canal, and they wanted to assess viability. And notice here we see this, sound, this solid rounded mass contiguous with the wall of the gestational sac. Here's a couple more examples. And you can see they look a little bit different, but they're rounded, echogenic, and appear attached to the sac wall. Anybody know what this is? Have you seen this before? This is called a chorionic bump. And the chorionic bump may represent subchorionic hematoma. Some people think it may be a vanishing twin. We're not really sure. It's not very common. But you will see it when you, when you do a lot of early first trimester pregnancies. There seems to be an association with infertility treatments such as IVF and IUI, and there's a guarded prognosis here. Again, I think the larger the abnormality, the less likely it will be a normal pregnancy. So let's talk about goals for sonography in the first trimester. We want to improve accuracy for diagnosing non-viability. At the same time, we want to avoid harming a normal intrauterine pregnancy. And in those patients who present vaginal bleeding, we want to make sure we can distinguish an abnormal IUP from an ectopic pregnancy. 
Now, this is a landmark paper that was published a few years ago in the New England Journal uh, by Dubolet et al. And it was sponsored by the Society of Radiologists and Ultrasound. And in this paper, they talk about specific diagnostic criteria for determining non-viability or failed intrauterine pregnancy. And they define some terms. Viable, obviously, is a pregnancy that can potentially result in a live-born baby versus a non-viable pregnancy, which cannot possibly result in a live baby. And it could be either represent a failed IUP or an ectopic pregnancy. And I think these terms are very useful. We use them all the time now in our reports. When we see patients that have uh, an intrauterine gestational sac with no embryo with a heartbeat and no definite signs of a failed pregnancy, we call this an intrauterine pregnancy of uncertain viability. The other useful term is a pregnancy of unknown location, where a patient presents with a positive pregnancy test, but we don't see an intrauterine or an ectopic pregnancy on our scan. So here's an example of an intrauterine pregnancy of uncertain viability. We have this very small sac within the endometrial canal in this uterus but it's too small to tell if it's an early IUP, if it's a pseudogestational sac, if it's a non-viable pregnancy, or even the, if just fluid in the canal in a patient with an ectopic pregnancy. We can't tell. So it's a pregnancy of uncertain viability needs to be followed up. Here's a case of a pregnancy of unknown location. Patient presents with a positive urine or serum pregnancy test, but we do not see evidence of a pregnancy, not in the uterus, not in the adnexa, no definite intrauterine or ectopic pregnancy seen on our scan. That's a pregnancy of unknown location. So in these cases, we don't know where the pregnancy is. If the HCG is greater than 3000, a normal IUP is unlikely. And it most likely represents a non-viable IUP. And this is more common than an ectopic pregnancy. So we would, we would lean toward that, but we can't exclude the ectopic, so we have to follow what up. And we'll repeat the ultrasound and the HCG before treating for ectopic pregnancy. Now, here are some of the diagnostic criteria included in that Dubolet article. And I recommend everyone find the article, download it, put it on your phone, uh, because it's, it's a good read and you need to have these criteria at your fingertips. A mean sac diameter greater than or equal to 25 millimeters and no embryo is a failed pregnancy. A crown rump length greater than or equal to 7 millimeters, no heartbeat, is an abnormal pregnancy. If there's no embryo or heartbeat of at least two weeks after a scan with a gestational sac, that's also abnormal. And no embryo or heartbeat at at least 11 days after a scan with a gestational sac and a yolk sac is considered a failed pregnancy. Again, recommend that you look at the article to understand the rationale for these criteria. Here's a patient, last menstrual period, uh, six to seven weeks, vaginal bleeding. We have an empty sac. The mean sac diameter is 25 millimeters, so it's a failed pregnancy large sac, no embryo, and, we, and it's, there's no chance that this is going to be a normal pregnancy. Here's a patient who presents with first trimester bleeding, rule out ectopic. Here's a scan through the uterus. We can see the crown rump length is seven millimeters, which again, at seven millimeters, we should see a heartbeat. Here's the M mode. There's no activity on the M mode tracing. So this is an embryonic demise. We have an enlarged embryo with no heartbeat. Here's a patient status post-IVF. Had follow-up sonography two weeks later with no interval growth. And that's the key here. There was no change in size of the sac in two weeks. As you notice here from the measurement, it's out of range for gestational age. So no interval growth. This is abnormal. This is pregnancy failure. How about this one? This is interesting. Here's a 27-year-old presents with vaginal spotting. And what we're seeing here is an empty gestational sac. Or, or is it a pseudogestational sac associated with an ectopic pregnancy? 
can't really tell from this image alone. So in cases like this, where we think it's an abnormal pregnancy, but are trying to distinguish between an abnormal IUP and a pseudogestational sac of an ectopic pregnancy, we can use color. And you see how color lights up around the sac. And when we sample that with pulse Doppler, we'll see that we are getting a velocity of about 46 centimeters per second. As you can see it's a relatively high velocity, low resistance flow pattern consistent with placental flow, meaning that there is evidence of intrauterine placentation. This is an abnormal intrauterine pregnancy, not a pseudosac associated with an ectopic. Now, this was work based years ago at Yale with Evan Dillon and Ken Taylor, where we found that we would see increased flow around the gestational sac related to invasion of the trophoblast into the uterus. And we would start to see this increased blood flow around the sac five weeks after the last menstrual period. And we came up with a cutoff of 21 centimeters per second with a zero degree angle to characterize placental flow. It allows the examiner to determine evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy. So this is where it's valuable. Here's a patient presents vaginal bleeding. We want to assess for an intrauterine pregnancy versus an ectopic pregnancy. Now we clearly see an abnormal looking sac-like structure in the uterus. It's got irregularities, some internal contents. Not sure if that's blood, if that's related to a pregnancy. Not really sure what's going on. And when we turn on the color, we can see that there is placental flow associated with this tissue. The velocity is about 41 centimeters per second. So now we know we're dealing with an abnormal intrauterine sac. This is a non-viable pregnancy, not a pseudogestational sac. How about this one? Here's a patient who presented with a history of an IUP from a prior study with new vaginal bleeding assessed for viability. And if you look at the uterus here, it's vaginal skin, you know, you don't really see much. There's certainly no sac there, and we don't really see fluid or any other tissue. But interestingly, you turn the color on and the endometrium lights up. You can see this tremendous vascularity there. And we have very high velocity flow, over 125 centimeters per second, low resistance pattern. This is telling us that this is a patient that had an incomplete abortion and there's retained tissue there. Very challenging to see on the grayscale image alone. And one more example of the value of color. Here's a patient of I, with a history of an IUP on a prior study, presents with vaginal bleeding, with a, drop, with a falling HCG. Again, the initial scan doesn't show much. The endometrium is not very thickened. We don't really see any fluid or anything there. We turn the color on and we can see there's a little bit of fluid with no increased flow. And what we're dealing with here is a complete abortion. No residual tissue left within the cavity. Just a few words about ectopic pregnancy. Now we know that at least 95% of ectopic pregnancies occur within the ampullary portion of the fallopian tube. But we also know to look around in other locations, uh, less commonly we'll see it associated with the cervix, in a C-section scar, in the interstitial portion of the fallopian tube. And very uncommonly, it could be associated with being close or within the ovary or out in the abdomen. So we typically focus on the tube. Now, when we talk about different types of ectopic pregnancy, the word cornual is used a lot and it's very misused. You know, if you read the obstetric literature, a corneal pregnancy really refers to an eccentric gestational sac in the uterus or a pregnancy in the horn of a bicornuate uterus or a septate uterus. It doesn't refer specifically to an ectopic pregnancy. We misuse the term. If we're referring to an ectopic pregnancy that's in the interstitial portion of the tube, then we use the term interstitial pregnancy. That is an ectopic pregnancy. It's separate from the endometrium and it's not viable. The other term we, sh we should use is angular pregnancy. This is a pregnancy that is located within the endometrial canal, but eccentric, supralateral, and can be confused with an interstitial pregnancy. So the interstitial pregnancy is in the interstitial portion of the tube. It's not in the endometrial canal. It is an ectopic pregnancy. The angular pregnancy is within the 
endometrium, but it's eccentric, usually high up there, and can mimic an interstitial pregnancy. And this is where 3D ultrasound is so helpful. We use it all the time in these cases because it helps us to distinguish these entities. All right, I have maybe a minute or two left. I want to finish up with some memorable misses. And this would include things like a gestational sac versus a hematoma, uh, ectopic pregnancy versus IUP, and a C-section scar ectopic pregnancy. So here's one of these memorable misses. Here's a patient presented with vaginal bleeding, assessed viability. And we're looking at the uterus, it's a vaginal scan, and the sonographer is measuring this echogenic structure here and measures it at 1.8 centimeters consistent with an eight week, two day uh, embryo. No heartbeat seen, but was considered to be an intrauterine pregnancy. Upon further inspection, we see that in fact, this patient has a large ectopic pregnancy. And what we were looking at is really blood in the endometrial canal. So one has to be very careful what they call an IUP and make sure they take a good look around. This is the classic tubal ring or lifesaver appearance of an ectopic pregnancy in the fallopian tube. And you can see there's a little bit of hemorrhage around it. Here was another miss. Um, this was done years ago, and it was a 32-year-old presented positive HCG assessed intrauterine pregnancy. And I guess perhaps you know that that diagnosis was misleading. Assess IUP, and so you know they they did the scan and they identify this embryo with a crown rump length of 2.4 centimeters, consistent with nine weeks, one day gestational age, and this was called an intrauterine pregnancy. Uh, unfortunately they didn't take a real good look around because this isn't the uterus. This is the adnexa. And this is an ectopic pregnancy, not an intrauterine pregnancy. And this was discovered on a follow-up study. Not a good thing at all. Don't want to make that mistake. And finally, here's a patient presented with vaginal bleeding, assessed viability. On the transvaginal scan, this was originally thought as being in the endometrial canal. You can see the sac in the yolk sac here. But if you look at the transabdominal skin, you clearly see it's too low. It's in the lower uterine segment, bulging anteriorly. This is a section scar pregnancy. Okay, so to conclude, remember the clinical history, the AC levels, the transvaginal ultrasound findings together are very important to help you make that diagnosis. You wanna make sure you look and recognize those normal landmarks. And when in doubt, you wanna do a follow-up sonogram and repeat the HCG before treating patients for ectopic pregnancy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Pellerito. Uh, it was great, uh, a, a great talk and, uh, and great hearing your voice. Um, be well, I'd like to thank all the attendees and uh, for joining and we will see you again um, next week. Thanks so much everybody. Be well.